Welcome to Chapter 5, Week 6 of Muscles of the Neck and Torso. I will be your host and instructor, Brad Swearingen. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, here we see the muscles of the neck and torso. Here we see a frontal view um, of the neck and torso, muscles of the torso. And uh, the muscles are recognizable on the surface. And here we see with the skin removed, uh, many of the muscles. Some of the more common muscles that we talk about, the deltoids are in the shoulder, the pectoralis or pecs as we call them are in the chest area. Um, other muscles that we talk about, the rectus abdominis, those are our abs that we call abs. We shorten the names of them. Um, other muscles that we see that you may not be as familiar with are the serratus anterior, which you can see right over here near the rib cage. We'll talk about those today also. Um, also our external obliques down here. And then also up here in the neck, we see the sternocleidomastoid, uh, the trapezius, and then this infrahyoid muscle group. So we'll talk about all these muscles today. And uh, some, so those are common names, and uh, we shorten the names of these muscles just to make it easier to recognize and easier to talk about them. So some of the things that you want to relate them to are trapezius. That's actually, we just call that our shoulder muscle. Um, the pectoralis major, that's our chest or our pecs. And then the rectus abdominis, we said that those are our abs, but we also refer to those as our six-pack. And uh, sometimes we like to say, yes, I have a six-pack, but it's insulated. So you can't actually see the muscle definition, even though it's there. And then um, lastly, our external obliques, which you can see down here, um, we refer to those as our love handles. And uh, even though a lot of that is muscle down there, um, we still call them our love handles. All right, here's a posterior view of our muscles of the torso. And if you'll notice, they're grouped by location. We have anterior muscles, posterior muscles, or they can also be classified by the anatomical region of them, such as abdominal region, scapular region, or we can even group them by placement in relation to the surface. So we have superficial muscles, we have intermediate layers, or even a deep layer of muscles. And we can't always see all the muscles on the exterior, no matter how much we work them out or exercise them, because they're underneath other muscles. And we'll get to those. But um, here's another listing of the muscles, some that we don't really see from the a frontal view that we can see from a posterior view would be the trapezius, and we call those our traps, um, the infraspinatus, uh, the teres major and minor, our rhomboids, um, and then our latissimus dorsi, or lats. And, uh, and then again, we can almost see the external obliques over here on the left and right side. And then we've all heard of the gluteus maximus. That's our butt muscle, right? But did you know there is also a gluteus medius um, as well? And uh, so these are some of the muscles that we will talk about today. All right, names of torso muscles. So all these different names, how do I know what they are and how do I know where they are on the body and how do I know what they mean? So here's a listing of, uh, of the names of torso muscles and um, they kind of provide clues as to the location, shape, size, or direction of the muscle fibers. So for instance, abdominus, it just means the abdominal region. So uh, it's pretty easy to remember abs and uh, so we'll just remember that abdominus pertains to the abdominal region. We'll also remember that pectoralis refers to the chest region. Anterior, as we remember from a couple weeks ago, means front. Uh, posterior means back. Um, and in this case, also dorsi means back, kind of like a dorsal fin of a, uh, of a shark or a dolphin. And uh, so dorsi means back. And then spinalis or spinalis um, or spinatus indicates a location. You can either use the long A sound or the short A sound with that. Indicates a location on or near a sharp bony projection such as the spine. Um, external means outer, internal means inner. Major means larger, meaning a larger muscle. Well, if there's a major, usually there's a minor. So there's a smaller muscle as well. And then rectus means straight. So it means a straight muscle. And then oblique means slanted or diagonal. So when we have these external obliques that we referred to, 
those are not horizontal or, or perpendicular. Those are slanted or diagonal muscles. Here you can see a good view of the muscles from the side. And we can see some of both the front, the uh, anterior and posterior. So we see again the trapezius, the sternocleidomastoid, our pectoralis, the deltoids. There's a great view of the deltoids. Our scapula muscles, the latissimus dorsi, which starts at the back and kind of wraps around the side. Um, the serratus anterior, uh, rectus abdominis, external obliques. Um, and then we see the gluteus medius, the gluteus maximus, and, um, <clears throat> and then uh, those are the muscles. All right, so let's start up near the top, the muscles of the neck. And the muscles of the neck transition between the head and the torso. And uh, we do have a lot of movement in our head. We're allowed to move side to side, up and down, and even at oblique angles, meaning it doesn't have to always be horizontal or perpendicular. It can be uh, an oblique movement, angled, side to side, or from upper right to lower left. Um, here are the muscles. So we have this muscle group inside of here called the infrahyoid muscle group. And then there's this large muscle right here. And if you actually, you can actually feel that muscle. It's very prominent in your neck. And uh, while you're listening to this, I would like you to go ahead and feel some of these muscles that we're talking about. And you can feel that sternocleidomastoid muscle there, and it's, it does a great job of supporting your head and moving your neck around. Then also you can see the trapezius as it starts here um, near the shoulder, and it moves upwards towards the neck. And again, it does a great job of supporting the head, moving the head um, around. And then we have our deltoids and our pectoralis major. Now if you look, the starting position here is the sternum and the clavicle. And so um, the sternum and the clavicle, and uh, it helps bend, twist the neck and head. And then we have all these different types of movements, flexion, lateral flexion, rotation. And uh, again, I hope I don't have to explain these terms because we've been talking about them for a few weeks now. And inside um, this group here, we have the larynx, the trachea, the thyroid cartilage, um, and the gland inside there. All right, here's a great picture when you lift your head up here again, we can see that sternocleidomastoid muscle on either side right there. But then we get all these tiny little muscles inside there that are really difficult to see because they're kind of tucked inside there. Um, and all these different hyoid muscles, that's why it's called the infrahyoid muscle group because there's all these hyoid muscles, the mylohyoid, the stylohyoid, um, sternohyoid, the omohyoid. So all of these different muscles are inside of there. Again, we see the trapezius. Um, there's the inferior belly, the omohyoid muscle coming right through there. As it comes through, it comes around and comes up here. And that's the superior one, and that's the inferior one right inside there. All right, moving down, we have muscles of the thorax. We see here's a great view of the rib cage. And uh, we see an anterior view, a posterior view, and a lateral view. And the pectoralis major, that's this big fan muscle right here in the chest area. And it helps move the humerus, our arm muscle, and, or our arm uh, bone. And the pectoralis minor helps move the scapula. And then the serratus anterior helps move the scapula. Here you get to see um, all of those. Here's the serratus anterior. Um, here's the pectoralis major, and then we also see the deltoids uh, as well. Muscles of the thorax here on the rib cage, the pectoralis major. It's like I said, it's this large fan-shaped muscle, and uh, it has three different parts to it. And uh, we'll look at it in a couple different ways. First of all, we have the clavicular portion here, where it attaches to the clavicle. Then we have the sternal portion. And it's called that because it actually attaches um, to the sternum. And then we have the abdominal portion because it attaches in the abdominal region um, of our chest. As we, as we contract the muscle, the muscle fibers pull across the rib cage and they converge to attach on the humerus. All three of these different regions of the pectoralis major, they pull and they attach up here on the, um, on the humerus. Now, um, we'll be able to see the attachment site better in just a moment, but you can see they all kind of pull right up inside here and they tuck inside there, right next to that deltoid. So when the upper arm's lifted away, then the insertion of the muscle, you can see it a little bit better there. 
I have a couple more um, images that we'll take a look at where you can see a, a great uh, part of where that uh, gets inserted in there. So here's a, another image. The pectoralis major moves the humerus in different ways, depending on which portion's contracting and which other muscles are assisting with it. And the main actions are moving the humerus in a forward direction, meaning flexion, moving the humerus from an overhead position, returning it to the side of the torso, and also rotating the humerus in an inward direction. It's as if my arms were outstretched, thumbs up, and then I rotated my thumbs downward. And so when I'm rotating my humerus in that direction, um, the pectoralis major aids, in that, uh, aids and assists in that movement. And also this picture, you can also see um, a couple other muscles that we're getting to see here. The teres major, um, the latissimus dorsi, which here it looks like a small little muscle right there. This lat that comes up here and has its attachment site up here in the humerus, as it bends around and goes around to the back side, it becomes a very large muscle on the back side. So up here, it kind of converges and thins out and narrows, and it tucks in up there on the humerus. But uh, on, you'll see it when we look at the uh, a posterior view. You'll see how it's actually a very large muscle. And then the serratus anterior right here, which these muscles, we'll talk more about them, um, but they attach to the rib cage. All right, here's a seated female figure. Um, it's an upper part of the pectoralis major, flat up against the rib cage, and then we also see soft tissue forms of the breast, glandular tissue and fatty tissue. So here's the trapezius, and you'll notice that the uh, artist has highlighted the areas, um, and even though this, uh, this uh, acromion process right here, it looks like it's sticking out really far, it's just kind of exaggerated a little bit so we can see it a little bit better in there. The pectoralis major right there, and then the gland uh, breast form, glandular, and fatty tissue form. So you can see where the chest muscles would be right inside here. All right, the pectoralis minor. Let's take a look at this. It's got three muscle strips beneath the pectoralis major. Um, each one of them begins on a different rib. So here's our pectoralis minor. So here's the major, and you can't see the minor, but look how the pectoralis major, it attaches to the humerus in here. You can see the motions that that would, um, that would create and allow here. So the muscles, the pectoralis major attaches on the humerus. And then underneath this, if we remove the pectoralis major over here, you can see the pectoralis minor. These three little muscles attaching to the ribs. And then again, we get to see the serratus anterior. And again, we'll talk more about those in just a moment. Um, where the muscles of the pectoralis minor, look where they attach. Not on the humerus, pectoralis major attaches on the humerus, pectoralis minor attaches up here in the coracoid process of the scapula. And so that's that little muscle, or that's that uh, uh, little bone right there. But this bone, that's not just a little bone, it's a bone, part of a bone, because it's attached to the scapula. And when we see a posterior view, the scapula is actually a much larger bone. It almost looks like a fan blade, or uh, I think we looked at a couple weeks ago, it looks more like a trowel. Um, a garden trowel. But anyway, this muscle, the pectoralis minor, it helps lower the shoulder blade in depression of the scapula, and it also moves the scapula in a forward direction when the scapula is protracting. Here's a great view of the serratus anterior. You can see the Hulk, he's got his arms raised up there, and then we see the serratus anterior, all these little highlighted areas right there on his rib cage. Those are not ribs, those are muscles. There, these muscles are actually attached to ribs, which you can see right here. Those are the ribs, um, but this is the muscle, those little bumps right there. Those are the serratus anterior. He's also got a great uh, uh, six-pack going right there. And even here, since we've talked about the uh, pectoralis major, we can see where his packs are up there inside the attachment sites on either side there. And so that bone, that bone does not come down this way. This is all just fleshy muscle. There's the latissimus dorsi. And you see, he's built up his latissimus dorsi so much that it's not just a strap, uh, not just a thin muscle coming in there, but he's really built it up. So think about the end of the humerus right here. And that end of the humerus attaches all the way. It comes this direction in here because that's where the pectoralis major is attaching to it. So the humerus has to come up this way and come through there. So this is all just flesh 
right inside their muscle. There's no bone right in there. That's all muscle. And then that bone comes this direction and attaches. And there's the, uh, the shoulder complex in there where we have the coracoid process and the, um, and the shoulder blade and the clavicle all come together with the humerus in there. <clears throat> Here's a great view of the serratus anterior. It's a fan-shaped muscle that we can see. And if you look, it attaches. Uh, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And usually there's about eight or nine of those. And so there's another one that's tucked back up in there that we can't see. And maybe even two more that are tucked up there we can't see. Notice the attachment sites. The serratus anterior attaches right here to the, um, to the ribs. And, uh, and it wraps around the side of the rib cage and it inserts into the medial border of the scapula. Now here's our scapula. And remember we said it's shaped like a garden trowel right there. And uh, the uh, uh, chromium or the coracoid process was up there. We can't really see it here from this view, but that's attached to our scapula right here. So that is attached to the inside there where we can't actually see the attachment side from this view. So it's mostly hidden by the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi muscles. Um, so normally when we look and see someone's serratus anterior, we're just seeing usually the little tips of the fingers of the muscle right inside there. Just these areas right where the attachment sites are on the ribs. The main actions of the serratus anterior are protraction and upward rotation of the scapula. And here you can see it between our latissimus dorsi and the pectoralis major. So here's another view of the serratus anterior right inside there. And again, these are going to be the, the ribs, but there's the that's the muscle right inside there. Here's another good view. And uh, comic book artists love to be able to draw those uh, muscles in there. And it makes them look like they're huge. And here it's almost a little, eh, it's kind of hard to tell because he's got his... Uh, here we see the pectoralis major and the attachment site going into the humerus, and uh, it almost looks like if these are the if these are the serratus anterior, then his latissimus dorsi is hiding way back there. Um, but it almost looks like this is the latissimus dorsi, and these are the serratus anterior, and then you can't really see the ribs there. So this is a little bit. Um, it's not as clear as we'd like it to be, but still it's a, a good view of, you can see someone's, an art, artist's view of, uh, of the torso. All right, now we're no looking at the abs or the rectus abdominis. This is divided into three horizontal fibrous lines called transverse lines. And uh, here's the lines right here. This one's more at an angle. Here we see a transverse line, another transverse line right there. So it's divided up. We have those three lines. And uh, it's divided by a vertical fibrous line called the linea alba. And that's this line right down the middle here, the linea alba. And you can see right inside there is kind of where the belly button goes. That's kind of where they're uh, putting that. And belly button positions can be higher or lower. Um, but anyway, there's the linea alba. And our abs, or the rectus abdominis, frequently known as the six-pack. And we like to have the six-pack. Um, we like it to be showing, but we also like to eat sweets, right? So <laughs> many times uh, we don't, we're not able to see our six pack. And one of the greatest causes, actually, of um, of getting belly fat is sugar. And so, uh, if you'd like to have a more uh, viewable six pack, eat less sugar. And so uh, that's what you have to kind of, that's what you have to do. So sugar is a main cause of belly fat, which keeps us, it, it increases the fat, the love handles around our external obliques. It increases the insulation around our six pack. So we have an insulated six pack. Um, but anyway, here's a good view. And here you can see again, the serratus anterior or external obliques. Uh, um, and then this, uh, what else, rectus abdominis muscle. So we've got this little, these little ab muscles right up top there. We'll see a good picture of those here in just a moment on, uh, on uh, a real person. Rectus abdominis muscles. So you can see they're right there. And then ones we don't normally see. Some people can say they actually have an eight pack because they've, they've worked out these muscles right down here as well so that they can build those muscles up. So then they have one, two, three, four on each side, giving them an eight pack. That's kind of challenging. That's really difficult to do. 
because uh, the most prominent ones we see are these top six ones right up there. Here's a, uh, another view of the rectus abdominis. Here we see the, uh, uh, the anterior and lateral regions. Um, below the navel, the muscle divides into two more segments, and that can give us, like I said, that eight-pack. Um, fatty tissue that we have down there in our belly region, um, it kind of softens it up so that instead of looking like two muscles, a lot of times it just looks like one segment down there. Um, the rectus abdominis begins on the pubic bone. We can see that right down here. And it pulls straight up to attach to the xiphoid process um, of the sternum. And it helps the torso bend forward. So when we're bending forward, these muscles pull. And each muscle pulls, which pulls the torso uh, forward. So when you're doing a sit-up, that's why your sit-ups can help uh, increase the size of the muscles and, and increases the health. Um, of the muscles as well. And so, uh, and some people think, well, I'm doing all these sit ups. Why does my stomach look bigger? Well, when you exercise your muscles and your muscles get bigger, but you don't eat right or you continue to eat the sugar, what happens is the muscles are getting bigger, but they start to push all that fatty tissue out further. So you can have really strong abs and, uh, and still look like you've got a little fat or a little extra around the waist there because the muscle, as it's getting stronger and bigger, it actually pushes the fatty tissue out. So, uh, so as you do your workouts, you have to also um, eat right, which means cutting out some of that sugar. So anyway, it helps the torso bend forward and it helps raise the body from a supine position um, when you're laying down in bed in the morning on your back and uh, the alarm goes off and you want to sit up these muscles help you to sit straight up in bed and, uh, and, uh, and wake up in the morning. So here we see a uh, posterior view of some of these muscles. Now this is the external oblique aponeurosis. It's the uh, anterior layer, the rect also called the rectus sheath right there. And this is from a posterior view. Keep that in mind. And so we'll be able to see this a little bit on some... Uh, um, I'm sorry, this is on the front view. And we get to see this as it's covering... Um, as it covers uh, the front of our torso. And then we, here we have the, uh, uh, the serratus anterior. All right, here's a close-up version, a little bit different. Um, here we can see the internal oblique aponeurosis, the covering, um, the thoracombular fascia, and the rectus sheath. All right, our external obliques located on the lateral side of our torso <clears throat> consists of eight elongated muscle digitations. And I've read some places it says eight or nine, so we'll see, but consists of eight elongated muscle digitations divided into two portions. And we have the thoracic portion that we can see over here on our thorax. Um, and then we also have the abdominal portion near the flank pad down here, our external obliques. And when we talk about external ab obliques, we normally think about the flank pad portion. Um, it, it's not common for us to think, oh, we've got uh, the thoracic portion of the external obliques. That's, uh, that's not common to think about that, but they do go up there. So the flank pad shows around the, uh, the waistline area, and uh, they begin on the lower eight ribs, five through 12. So here you can see the flank pad portion, even tucking around to the side. The differences in our uh, rectus abdominis, or our abs, male versus female versions. Here you can see the thoracic arch in both the male and the female. And here we see the six pack. So we will count, we've got two muscles, four, six. And then here's that other, it's a little bit softer form, even though there's two muscles there, Sometimes that's included and we say, oh, I've worked out so hard I have an eight pack. And so you could count two, four, six. And when you're wearing your gym shorts or whatever, that looks like another two to make it an eight pack in there. The female form can be a little bit softer. And uh, here we see the thoracic arch, the external obliques on either side, um, the ingu uh, inguinal ligament. But uh, here's the kind of the differences between the two. The uh, author... Um, shows this or demonstrates it and says it's easy to remember if you literally think about a six-pack looking at it from a top-down view and uh, a six-pack of, of uh, drinks. And then a female figure is softer, more like a violin. 
and so it's a little bit softer form. It doesn't have that. Uh, it doesn't have that definition of the roundness of the of the cans there. It's kind of softer, and it forms and moves around there. So having said this, women can also have this really well defined uh, muscle musculature there. Let's take a look at that. So here's a picture. Here we can see the male version where we can count two, four, six. We see the six pack right in there. And even on women, here we can see two, four, six, um, a well defined six pack right there. And you can even start to see the external obliques are right here as they come up. And uh, we can't really see the serratus, serratus anterior right up in there. That's where her shirt is right in there. And he's not flexing his serratus anterior, but that's right in there. And his external obliques, you can just see right there sticking out a little bit. So, um, but anyway, you can see it can be well defined on both as well. Muscles of the back. So muscles of the back move the shoulder blade, the upper arm, and the back. Um, and uh, they attach to the clavicle, the humerus, and the vertebral column. And uh, these muscles attach along the vertebral column, and there's many attachment sites there. We've looked at the bones of the vertebral column, and there's many different attachment sites in there to aid and allow for movement so that we can move uh, side to side, up and down, forward, backward, and uh, it just helps us to move in many different directions. So here we have them divided into three muscle layers. There's a superficial layer, meaning nearer to the skin, There's uh, which are the trapezius and the latissimus dorsi. So when we go to the gym and we want to work out our traps, and so that's this muscle right up here, our trapezius, and then the trapezius, there's the muscle. It kind of fans out down here as well. Then we have the latissimus dorsi. Those are the lats. And they tuck in and they, um, they attach here. And they come up through. Remember, they come up through and they attach on the humerus. And then, uh, and then we have the intermediate layer, which is the rhomboid major and minor and the levator scapulae. And uh, over here, if we were to remove this trapezius muscle, underneath that, it will find the intermediate layer the rhomboid major, which is these little diagonal muscles here, and the rhomboid minor underneath those. But um, it's rare that you're going to be able to see those. You actually can see, uh, uh, here's the scapular muscular group right inside there. But the deep layer is going to be um, the sacrospinalis. It can also be pronounced with a long A sound, the sacrospinalis. Um, but anyway, we see this little, um, this little uh, muscle group right inside there. And uh, I think I've got a picture we'll look at in just a moment here of uh, what does that look like when there's a skin covering on. You can work this muscle out so it can be seen on the outside there, as you can see, because if we just cover this with some skin, you have the trapezius, the latissimus dorsi, and then that leaves a little opening for some muscles that we can see right inside there. So let's take a look. All right, here we see the trapezius, the superficial layer. So we see the traps coming all the way. Their attachment sites are up here in the neck coming down but look at this this uh this man has worked out so much that there it's this huge muscle right down through here here's the latissimus dorsi the lats and uh and these are the rhomboids right inside there uh the rhomboid muscles here you can also see the deltoids you can see the triceps um, that are in there and uh but again intermediate layer the rhomboid major and minor and you can see the rhomboid group right inside there um, the levator scapulae, kind of hard to see that in there. But anyway, the sacrospinellus is a deep layer that we just were not able to see on this. All right, here's another uh, view of that. Here you can see the latissimus dorsi muscles have been worked out to the point where they actually wrap all the way around here. So this is a little different picture because the trapezius is up there. And this trapezius um, is in its... He's worked out the muscle a little bit differently than the, than the other guy. And also, it's a little bit different pose. Look at his arms are tucked in really close here um, to his, uh, he's trying to show off his lats, his latissimus dorsi here. So his arms are tucked inside and uh, he's contracting as opposed to this guy where, look, his arms are out in a little bit and he's got his uh, hands on his waist there. So his arms are not in there. So it's a little bit different pose and uh, different poses make different muscles more prominent. And so that's why, that's why this muscle looks so huge here. And the lats don't look as large. But then here, the lats look a, 
um, really large and the trapezius doesn't look as large anymore. That can be due to just a pose. All right, what about this superficial muscle layer uh, that we've been talking about, the lats and the traps? So what they do is they move the shoulder blade in the upper arm, and uh, these aid in the movement of the humerus. Um, they help create the shoulder forms, the back of the neck, muscle forms of the upper back. And these fibers divide into three different portions. So we have the superior portion, the transverse portion, and then the inferior portion. And inferior doesn't mean lesser, that it's a lesser, it means it's lower. Superior in this case means it's on top, and inferior means it's just lower, it's below it. So superior is from the top, inferior is from below. So it's not a, it's not a lesser muscle. We saw the one guy who had worked it out and it was a huge muscle. Um, but each portion of these muscles moves the clavicle in a different way. Keep in mind, um, the clavicle is, is on the front. So these muscles help move that clavicle um, in the front and move the arm. And, uh, and that is it. That's the end of our discussion of muscles of the neck and torso. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've learned something. And uh, go around, take some time, and uh, go back through the, the um, slideshow and see if you can contract those muscles on your own body and see if you can feel them. And don't damage anything, but just kind of push around a little bit. See if you can get your serratus anterior muscles to, to um, contract and you can feel those. See if you can feel your pecs. See if you can feel your deltoids. And uh, if you have a friend, maybe you can uh, uh, poke around or, or look at a friend's back, the, the posterior view, so you can see the muscles in person there. And see if, you can, um, see if you can actually contract those muscles where you can feel them and actually make them contract and take a look at them. So um, anyway, um, it's a good way, especially for artists, to, um, it's good for them to know where the attachment sites are, what do the muscles look like, where are they? What do they look like when I can see them from the outside? And we it's one thing. We have drawings here that we've been looking at, but it's a great thing to be able to see it in person as well. So um, if you can have a friend and uh, get them to take their shirt off and, uh, and see if they can contract these muscles and take a look at them, um, I think you'll, you'll, see, you'll be able to see some attachment sites and you'll see how the muscles are able to blend together and work together. So thanks for listening. And I uh, hope you learned something.